नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू एक संवाद एट अरुणिम अंकुर सर्वे भवंतु सुखिना दिस इज अ सीरीज ऑफ टॉक्स ऑन साइकोलॉजी इन प्रैक्टिस एंड द ओकेजन वी आर सेलिब्रेटिंग इज वर्ल्ड मेंटल हेल्थ डे व्हिच इज ऑन 10th ऑफ अक्टूबर इंसिडेंटली अ संडे दिस टाइम women and mental health is the topic we are going to discuss our guests today are dr janki rajgopalan and dr lakshmi uh, thank you so much for joining in and welcome to ek sambad a word about uh, arunim ankuran an initiative for positive social change through self development the goal is greater well being and happiness for all at arunim ankuran we believe that each person is unique and special in some way that each person can make an impact each person can be a change agent and that's what we celebrate and that's what inspires us to according to the world health organization more than half of patients who meet the criteria for psychological illness get left undiagnosed uh, women seem to be the worst sufferers Some of the situations that contribute to mental health issues in women include caring for or supporting others, relationship breakdown, violence or abuse, discrimination based on sexuality or gender identity, fertility and perinatal loss, pregnancy, having a baby and becoming a mother, menopause and uh, indeed it's a pleasure to have two of my friends who are also mental health professionals on this panel so welcome again to ek sambad uh, janki we'll come to you first uh, talk to us about uh, reproductive health and mental wellness uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, pragya so uh, we uh, specifically i wanted to wanted to talk about reproductive mental health because uh the growth in the knowledge in this field has happened in the last around 3 decades so even though we know for i mean uh pregnancy childbirth and uh, you know puberty pubertal changes menopause i mean this is from time immemorial but the problems that are associated with it are discussed more openly only in the last 3 decades and that too you know i mean it's a very uh, interesting way in which the research has grown in this field uh the research grew because in 1985 uh, there was a, a study done by the public health survey um uh, in uh, the us and then they found that there was a large gap in the uh, you know mental health um, uh, treatment for women and then uh, there was uh, you know there was a need for research in that area and then they uh, commissioned people to research for it so the national institute of health then found that the men who were i mean there were mostly men who were researching um in this area so then they started including women as well and then the parliament uh, the us parliament passed a legislation in 1993 say 1993 or 1994 saying that women should also be included in research and women researchers are in, you know uh, the number of women researchers should be almost equal and that's when the research into women mental health group uh, women health and women uh, mental health group so uh, but still if you look at it uh, the number of uh, perinatal mental health um, you know uh, professionals is very very low uh, perinatal psychiatrists and the in, uh, the emphasis on teaching reproductive mental health uh, during you know uh, our uh, courses in our courses both in psychiatry and psychology is very little whereas this is such a huge field and it it influences everything so you know it influences infant mental health it influences the health of children and young people and uh, in a way it influences how society will shape up so uh, now if we look at the statistics in terms of um, what happens during uh, pregnancy Let, let's talk about pregnancy if you know because that's the one of the biggest transitions in a women's life in a woman's life so um, during pregnancy uh, the uh, number of people who go number of women who go through depressive symptoms is staggering it's uh, 50% so one out of two women will uh, have what we call as post uh, pregnancy blues right and if that pregnancy blues is addressed then it means that you know uh, if that is addressed then postpartum depression can be caught on early and uh, postpartum uh, like changes even anxiety or psychosis can be caught on early and um, in treatment can be done and then uh, a lot of other problems like maternal death 
and uh, maternal eclampsia during uh, delivery and uh, uh, the obstetric complications and post delivery complications can be avoided so i mean it is such a significant uh, place where an intervention can be done then uh, that is about blues but what about clinical depression clinical depression during pregnancy is around 3 to 5% and post pregnancy it it raises very sharply so it goes to about 15% so that's a very high number um and so how can uh, now when we talk about all of this how can we recognize it so that would be one of the very important uh, things to see so if a woman during pregnancy you know like has symptoms of depression as we have you know symptoms of depression in other uh, like other times during the life span uh, like sleeping less hmm. or having you know not being motivated to do things poor concentration poor appetite and uh, you know having other symptoms like you know having uh, low uh, you know thoughts very negative thoughts hopelessness helplessness worrying about the pregnancy worrying about the you know consequences of delivery Uh, worrying about the bodily changes or worrying about what will happen to the child things like that if these are excessive during pregnancy so one of the issues with this is that all of these when you say you know insomnia or you know decreased appetite all of these are normal uh, symptoms that women do you know have during the first second and third trimester especially you know in the first trimester you have nausea vomiting appetite goes down second trimester you know you have insomnia third and second and third trimester you have insomnia you, you don't feel like you know like uh, this because the baby is growing and because of the weight uh, the mother is not able to be comfortable so these kind of changes do happen and fatigue is very common during pregnancy so how do you differentiate that and how can one you know like find out that this is actually uh, you know depression so uh of course you know that there comes a role of maternal uh, screening for mental health issues so in many countries it has become mandatory to screen the uh, pregnant mother and also during post pregnancy during the lactation period for any kind of mental illnesses it has become uh, you know part of their regular screening procedure in india also there is uh, some movement that is happening perinatal psychiatrists and mental health workers are have been talking about this for some time but considering that the obstetric care and you know care during pregnancy is pretty uh, like uh, you know is is it is quite uh, underdeveloped you know the reach is uh, not that high in in, in india so uh, maternal mental health being made mandatory mandatory the screening being ma uh, made mandatory may or may not happen very soon but what we can do you know as you know like as people who if you see if you have a pregnant woman in your family then seeing you know asking her about how she's doing what she's feeling is she feeling happy you know you know most of the times is she feeling normal or happy um, and you know does she have any uh, negative thoughts any worries so finding out just asking and talking to the lady about what she's going through uh, is a good idea then of course you know we this is about during pregnancy then post delivery uh, is a very very crucial period as i said the uh, percentage of depression you know goes up very high now why does that uh, of course we'll talk about the risk factors in a moment but uh, uh, the percentage is uh, because it's so high at that time i think that is a very important phase where you know obstetricians gynecologists as well as uh, psychiatrists other mental health workers should be involved in the screening of the women Mm-hmm. who come for you know like post pregnancy checkups so many times uh, when you know the women come with the child for you know vaccinations of the child or for a child screening during the first three months you know when they go to a pediatrician you know at that time that time i think there must be in, uh, an inclusion of checking up uh, with the mother there are many screening tools as well which can be uh, you know used like there is an Ed- edinburgh uh, postnatal depression scale which is a pretty easy scale to use which uh, doctors can use and mental health workers can use uh, to find out whether the woman is depressed at that time so one of the th- indicators of whether a woman is uh, having you know very serious issues post pregnancy is whether what her opinion is about the child you know uh, is is the woman able to see the child as a, a you know a being who needs protection uh and also is able to see her own needs so this is where we come to you know how society uh, you know is uh, there is an influence of how society and social media perceives these things so there is a lot of portrayal on social media that women you know um during pregnancy and post pregnancy women are like the happiest uh, you know in their lives and you know it's like a it's like a miracle of course it is a miracle yes but then the perception of it and how a woman feels is not something that the society can decide it is an individualistic thing 
so a woman should be allowed it should be normalized for a woman to feel what she feels and to express you know even if she has negative thoughts about the pregnancy or during post pregnancy period about how difficult it is to raise a child right uh, a newborn is very difficult uh, to raise because you know you have to sacrifice your sleep you have to give you know you have to feed the child you have to make sure that the child is comfortable and you have to also take care of your body which is going undergoing so many changes right and the hormonal changes that are happening at that time are tremendous you know sudden drop of hormones that were there very high during pregnancy and sudden drop so there is a huge turmoil that is happening in the woman's mind and the body and she also has to care for this you know beautiful newborn baby so there needs to be you know a lot of understanding from you know, the society and so the portrayal of pregnancy and post pregnancy should be realistic in social media and uh, the uh, understanding of it from the family members should also be realistic a woman should be allowed to express herself uh you know openly so just quickly in terms of the risk factors because that's where we can again intervene is that you know if the woman has a past history of uh, psychiatric illness like depression and anxiety or there is a family history of depression and anxiety especially in the mother the maternal depression and anxiety the uh, other thing is that uh, those that is the psychiatric uh, psychological factors but if you look at other factors like social factors uh, in fact social factors are the single most important factors fact uh, determinant risk factor for postpartum depression so what that means is that uh, there there has been a study there have been many studies to show that the uh, support during pregnancy especially from the spouse and the uh, sharing of you know decision making like you know for example sharing the decision making of which hospital to have the delivery in or to have delivery at home whether to elect for cesarean or not and whether you know like uh, what kind of antenatal classes the woman has to take right all of this shared decision making about everything regarding the child about the process of pregnancy being aware of the process of pregnancy being aware of the complications that can happen getting you know a proper uh, antenatal checkups and doing some kind of exercise during pregnancy these kind of things can be positive you know like protective factors so uh, so the support uh, you know from the spouse from the family okay and uh, also financial and economic condition so in you know of course you know dietary uh, uh, you know that having a good diet and good sleep during pregnancy is so important and that can also determine whether a woman experiences postpartum uh, depression and also anxiety during you know the postpartum period so other risk factors are uh, lifestyle risk factors if the woman you know is is using any kind of uh, drugs you know or the man you know her spouse or someone in the family is using nicotine you know in the form of smoking that can be you know injurious to the uh, child and it can cause uh, uh, you know postpartum depression in the mother so and if the child is actually low birth weight or has issues then that becomes a high risk group because uh, children having uh, the mother having obstetric complications or the children having uh, complications becomes one of the most important risk factors again for postpartum depression so these are all places where we can intervene uh, to help the mother uh, but for all of this we must uh, recognize that the transition during pregnancy during the pregnancy and post delivery is you know extreme in a woman's life and it is very important to recognize the uh, you know the changes that happen so thanks a lot janki that was uh, extremely informative and i think some of the things that you said you know especially about drawing the line because all of us have had those experiences of you know wherever i got stuck and what's going on and you know nobody is bothered only i am getting through this alone and those moments are there i think for everyone who's gone through a pregnancy uh, but uh, th thanks to you we are probably more aware of you know how to draw the line and when someone needs help with that so we'll come to lakshmi like janki was also talking about social support and the role of other people who are around you uh, talk to us about that lakshmi women relationships and mental health yeah thank you janki that was very comprehensive and uh, uh, you know and i was uh, just thinking that the first relationship starts in the womb and you know we for each of us each of us every person the relationship starts in the womb and uh, you know so we are seemingly we, we are born in isolation but we are by ourselves but really you know it's a related 
uh, association and relationship starts right from there so just like you said you know uh, people i mean prenatal and all of these issues you know this is uh, very seminal i mean a uh, very universal experiences that from time immor- immemorial and that's how we have even come into being here i think relationship wise also we have come into being it, it's it's there forever you know we we can only be in in connection with uh somebody or something other than ourselves and uh and like famous poets have said you know no man is an island and you know we cannot be in the, like an island we are always in connection with others and uh, so i was just thinking that you know relationships uh, how we relate to each other what does it do for our uh, well being and you know how we connect with ourselves and with others so the relationships i think are also with ourselves uh, which most of the time we neglect and we probably can you know discuss that a little later about how we neglect or how we are made to neglect uh, especially you know in um uh, in when connected with the women and you know uh, all the gender differences and disparities that happen um so if you have to look at you know what psychologists say and uh, what other people uh, researchers in the field say they made uh, several studies they've done several studies to say that having close positive relationships give us a sense of purpose and a sense of belonging and a sense of well being as well so it's closely connected with our mental health and wellness and sense of wellness and which is which is kind of crucial you know we often forget that uh, their relationships are the most important aspects it's it's like like vital uh, connects that and uh, we have with other people and our mental health and our sense of well being and our physical health all are interlinked and they are so intricately um, related to each other and this i think is a vital part which we normally kind of uh, put aside perhaps and not really you know uh, or we just overlook it you know we don't really consider them um so in a sense you can call it you know in psychological or you know technical terms you can call it social support perhaps which which kind of describes you know that relationship sense a sense of belonging that we all uh, seem to seek have perhaps and uh, or be denied in certain cases in many cases and which has a bearing on our um uh, sense of well-being um so of course research uh, there's been tremendous research in this field to say that you know how people who are socially well connected with family and friends and communities and you know so many other uh, areas of activities uh, those who have greater so, uh, greater social support are much happier they are better adjusted they have fewer mental health issues as such uh, than people who have lesser number of connections so the more connections we seem to have um uh, and you know diverse uh, areas perhaps and diverse fields there is a greater chance of a better uh, mental health and sense of well being mm-hmm. um in all of these connections however one thing has been emphasized always and that is the quality of the relationships rather than the quantity mm-hmm. so even if you have few connections if they are of good quality you know which uh that makes it uh you know more um valuable and more significant for each of us uh rather than you know having uh so in the days especially of in our current days you know of uh, social media and you know so many uh seeming uh the you know they call friendships but uh you know what is the quality of the connections that we have with uh, i think uh, as research has been done even in that area where they said you may have so many but you actually have connections only with about 5% of your total uh, number of uh, you know whatever facebook or whoever uh, you are connected with on uh, social media uh, platforms and uh, so this quality makes a lot of difference in 
contributing to our sense of connectedness our sense of having relationships uh, so what we would call like a significant relationship and and you know uh, which contributes definitely to uh, again our physical mental psychological emotional health um, it's it's so uh, you know if we just look at our own circle of friends perhaps you know or a circle of uh, people we connect to um, if there is something that we need to share we we kind of you know seek out that particular person who we feel uh, we are most comfortable with and that i think defines that quality of relationship so there is something that you can trust Im- immensely about somebody or you know some some people and you seek them out it's it's possible that we seek them out for different issues you know for some we may uh, connect with uh, you know emotional issues or some for other psychological issues some for other physical issues so there so we can have uh, let's say walking buddies or you know and that's a different kind of relationship so we may have music uh, friends and you know we we talk about that so what in each of them the way we connect to each uh, person or uh, group or you know a section of people makes a lot of difference and all of that somehow integrates and becomes a part of our uh, overall sense of well-being and uh, mental health uh, and it has also been proved that living in toxic relationships or in constant conflicts tends to wear out the persons involved and sometimes it can turn out to be more damaging than having no connections at all uh, no relationships so negative influences uh uh kind of you know uh are more uh damaging perhaps and it feels better that to not have uh, any particular relationship rather than be in this uh, toxic relationship and um, again relating it with uh, janaki's uh, points about you know perinatal and you know the vital uh, crucial connections that we seem to have during this very very important uh, significant phase of our lives um, which which can be you know menarche menopause pregnancy you know so many uh, different phases that women especially uh, uh, they are unique to women and we all go through these phases um, so i was just uh, you know also thinking how um, uh, you know relationships change in each of these phases and uh, the connections we make you know during puberty is very different because of the age that we go through um then relationships change even during pregnancy mm-hmm. and uh, at childbirth many uh, uh, many people have talked about or confided in and how um lonely they have felt or how supported they have felt so either way you know it can go either way and uh, about having seemingly having a whole family to take care but actually feeling very lonely and isolated and you know unsupported and that can play a huge role and part in uh, affecting a person's uh, especially a woman's uh, mental health and sense of well-being because uh this is such a crucial phase you know such a important uh aspect of our lives you know our whole uh body is a whole sense of being and identity and everything is changing in this phase and um when relationships also change then it becomes extremely um uh, it can be very very stressful <laughs> to say i uh, use a you know most often used uh, term stress uh but it's it, it's very very uh, significant kind of a stressor that takes place you know and how relationships and connections we make with the people uh what kind of uh, trust issues we have or you know the whole uh, social support uh, uh what should i say ethos changes in this uh, in these phases especially and i would say i would even go further and say so even during the child raise rearing you know uh, raising a child even during those formative years of bringing up children um relationships social support all become 
extremely uh, important so there was a a counselee who had you know a person a woman who had approached some time ago long back who who you know who was so desperate because she didn't know what was happening so she uh, kind of had a baby and suddenly found herself all by herself you know very very lonely and isolated even though she was living in a joint family even though there were a whole lot of people in the house in the home uh but you know Uh, there didn't seem to be any kind of uh, insight into what a woman needs during that time you know so seemingly they all good people it's not about you know the goodness of each individual but how you relate and how you connect and have that particular insight uh, about what you might need and i think relationship would relate to that you know that particular aspect about how uh you tune in to the other person and here i i cannot but help bring uh, empathy into the picture uh, because you know to have that empathy to have that attunement to have that tuning in is so so important um uh, where you try and understand from the other person's perspective what is happening even though you may not have had that experience let's say it's uh, the spouse of the uh, woman uh, you may not have had the experience but still to be able to tune in you know show empathy for the person as such that becomes i think very very uh, crucial and all of these uh, factors start affecting and impacting mental health on how you connect so the connection is not just from the woman side um the woman is connecting to many different people including the baby and perhaps you know to so many others and all of these are new relationships you know you're forming these you're trying to maintain them you're sustaining so there's so much that is going on uh during uh these significant phases of all our lives um so these you know so things are happening differently of course the research also shows that uh, women and men are wired differently we can call it that uh, the brains themselves are different and uh, how we relate and how we connect um, research also shows that you know women make more long term and intimate connections than men do and women also kind of internalize more like they absorb more of the stress and you know other triggers more than men do who have a tendency to perhaps externalize you know it's easy for easier i would say for a man to perhaps just shout or vent out the frustration or you know get angry and express the anger in uh, acceptable ways or they are acceptable ways and you know when uh, a man perhaps does it than it is uh for the women, there are a lot more uh, social pressures i would say uh, or norms which are uh, kind of uh put on women uh and as a result again the way we connect with people uh changes so gender disparities have also been time immemorial i would say and uh, uh that is how it has been where there's this uh assumed role of some kind of dominance and a superiority based on perhaps certain factors let's say uh, physical attributes or physical qualities and uh women's uh qualities and attributes seem to be more uh you know wired towards uh, uh less towards physical prowess and more towards psychological and emotional uh functioning and and social connectedness so these are some some aspects you know and and a whole lot of other things follow like you know the self and identity all based on how uh, we relate and how women uh, you know make these relationships and connections and how it impacts their uh, mental health and well being thank you so much lakshmi and uh, you know just to listen to this it looks like you know all of us have been experiencing Absolutely. these elements yeah. in real life would you like to add something janki to what lakshmi said 
Uh, I, I thought uh, Lakshmi brought out very beautifully the importance of uh, relationships in different, you know, transitions during our life and, and in, in general, you know, uh, how we do need uh, people and how we connect to people. So, and, uh, you know, as a human being, not only as a woman, as, uh, as a human being, you know, we experience uh, relationships in different ways at, uh, in different, at different times. Uh, depending on how we what we are going through we experience relationships like that and we also need relationships to be in a particular way uh, when we are experiencing different phases different transitions in our life so i think you brought brought it out pretty you know pretty well uh, so i was uh, also wondering about the you know the the whole self and identity and personality of women through uh, you know through different phases of their lives it could be as a young girl and you know the socialization processes and you know it could be as a teen where you everybody is going through such uh, uh, you know integral and innate changes in one's physically and mentally and emotionally and psychologically also and i think uh, janaki you know if i'm not wrong uh, so many uh, conditions kind of set in during these uh yeah. you know very important transitions mm-hmm. like uh, you know anxiety perhaps or depression yeah. or even certain other more severe uh, uh yeah. conditions or which which i would say can be expressed due to either heredity or uh, you know environmental or social uh, factors which kind of trigger and start getting expressed because of it could be relationships it could be the social uh, environment or it could be you know uh, the whole family uh, conditions or functionality dysfunctionality of uh, you know uh, all that uh, we are surrounded by as well as all of these it can be like like they say the most key events of life are like you know birth marriage uh, you mm. know so many having uh, you know uh, all these different their stressors some of them may be considered good uh, socially and some of them are not so pleasant and uh, affect negatively but all of them do affect yes. uh, and and then we all undergo these changes in both the way we relate to others and to ourselves so i was just wondering pragya if you would like to uh, talk about how we relate to ourselves and you know what it does uh, Okay. so there's a whole lot of uh, mm. self worth and you know values and understandings awareness we place on ourselves as well mm. which yes. also bring about so many things absolutely i think the most important relationship is the one we have with ourselves mm. because there you can put question marks on what other people are thinking but what you think is a choice you make absolutely. you are always free to choose what you think you are free to uh, you know even experience your emotions in a certain way so to say so i got a few points that i think i'll share quickly one is you know whatever you focus on will grow mm-hmm. so if you focus on thoughts that make you feel low about yourselves that's going to grow second write your own script mm-hmm. just whatever else other people may have told you since you were a little child from your friends from your family everybody has been saying things and that goes into making your picture of yourself till you realize no this doesn't work so you can write your own script third is this idea of you know tumhari saadi meri saadi se safed kaise so long as we constantly compare ourselves to other people there's always going to be something which is you know different so instead of thinking of why is mine not white enough let's decide ours is a cream it's not white at all it's a different color <laughs> so then um next thing is everybody is a genius in some way so the thing to do is find out what you're a genius at you know what what is your superpower so to say what the, that's that's very important and i think all of us need to go into this journey within ourselves you know before we start building relationships with other people it's very important to be comfortable in your own skin and uh, for that i think we need to stop bothering about what other people are telling us so your own <laughs> self esteem is something that when you were a little kid and growing up other people were building once you grow up and you realize no it's not good enough for me you are free to build it on your own you are free to take it 
then i think uh, giving that permission you know absolutely. to yourself you know? yes yeah yes that then, that is somewhere we lose that uh, ha, sense of right. fear only seeking from somebody else yes. and that that causes a whole lot of uh, issues yeah so you know the idea of being the captain of your own ship yeah. and the the day you make that choice i think everything changes so uh, you know i always keep saying this you know when it comes to mental health we are not as helpless as we s- seem to feel when we are in that situation it's just that you need to remove the layers a little bit with somebody's help seek professional help to do that whatever help is required to get rid of uh, what has been uh, you know built on in a way that's not helping you and uh, one other important thing that i have experienced when i've spoken to people is that you know we are carrying baggage of toxic relationships that is spoiling our today and tomorrow and affecting relationships that we have with people we value also in a negative way mm. very important to forgive let go of the past and um, i think that's that's about it uh, look forward to tomorrow gra- with gratitude for what you have today and each one of us can build uh, our own futures and our own mental health invest time i think that's very important uh, when when we come to a point where we are breaking down that's only when we realize that okay this is something that need otherwise you talk to someone and say that you know try and meditate or spend time with yourself for 10 minutes there's no time nahi hai hmm. so you know that that time nahi hai thing it keeps on accumulating and then at some point of time you really have to sit down and drop everything else so before you come to that point i think it's very important start taking care of it so, yeah so it's like yeah. you know don't reach that crisis stage yes try not to reach the crisis stage although certain situations you know uh do happen and you know huh. then we need to uh, make that intervention and uh, and uh, professionals like janaki are Absolutely. always there to you know uh, so the other thing is to to have enough confidence to access these uh hmm. resources that are available uh, yeah. and not put you know our own judgmental thoughts on uh, on these resources i i think that's because even today mental health the word i mean the phrase mental health itself is you know it causes a lot of stigma just to even hear yeah uh, let alone talk about it need to fix a problem but it's actually to empower and enhance yes. uh, our sense of self and uh, you know i would like to say this that uh, we have uh, very charming psychiatrists you wouldn't be afraid to go to them there are people like janki you know mm-hmm. janki tell us exactly what happens when someone comes to you so that you know people are at ease uh, the moment you say psychiatrist people think of you know something uh, i don't want to go there kind of thing so tell us what happens when a person comes to meet you yeah so often uh, the first thing that a person will say you know when they come to meet uh, me many times they will say that you know uh, we were very anxious for this meeting we were very worried what will happen and many times when you explore further you know uh, after you've done your assessment you explore further what that anxiety was about it is usually about all the you know uh, negative things that they've heard about mental health you know practitioners that uh, they will give me you know sleeping medication uh, they will you know talk about all my uh, trauma in the past and bring it out and then make me you know really feel like i'm weak and i'm not you know good enough right? and then they will also minimize or invalidate what i'm going through like uh, because people have felt uh, you know that invalidation in their uh, you know in their in their near and dear ones have invalidated their feelings so they feel that the doctor will also do the same the doctor will be critical um, and many times it's also about you being labeled that is also a big uh, you know uh, worry that people have that the doctor will call me you know will certainly say that i'm some kind of mad person and then i'll have to carry this label forever and i'll have to take medications till the end of my life and that medication will in turn make me sleep or make me a zombie right so yes. this is what people think hmm. so but what we do is actually that we we just sit and talk to the first of all we have to understand what's going on in in the uh, client's mind and uh, nobody can understand somebody else's mind by looking at them or trying to do testing you know blood tests or anything like that it is not about testing it is about you telling you know the the client telling us 
what they are going through so it is only through language through to their body language through what they express their experience of things so we are not going to you know uh, drag out information from you that you don't want to give secondly uh, we are not going to make assumptions based on you know uh, something that we have in our mind we are going to make us you know make a diagnosis based on what you are going to tell us and the third thing is that everything is about sharing you know the, the everything will be a shared process we will tell you at every point every mental health practitioner will tell you what they're thinking about this you know what is going on with you what are uh, what is the likely diagnosis what is the treatment for it what are the options available what are the alternatives available many times clients come to me and tell me we don't want medication we want to know what are the alternatives what is my diagnosis what is the alternative okay if if you are not in a situation where you don't need medication then we will not you know enforce it right we we have no rights to enforce it we will ask you and we will tell you look this is the best way to go of course if there are risks involved then you know we'll have to you know escalate it further but you know if there is no risk involved then we you know and there will be options for it right so this is and one of that in you know in saying that many people think that we take away the rights of the client mm-hmm. you know like we will put them in a mental hospital so that again you know there are very strict rules and regulations around that there is a you know whole mental health act you cannot just put people in mental uh, institutions we cannot keep uh, people involuntarily and things like that so this is not going to you know this is again something that uh, people worry about uh, but it is uh, probably you know a consequence of how media depicts uh, yes. you know psychiatrists and uh, mentally unwell people one point that i want to clarify and i want you to say it you know because you're a psychiatrist is that you know what is the role of medication because a lot of people start feeling very concerned and like you rightly said hmm. you know yeah. so uh, what is the role of medication when it comes to treating mental illness yeah so there are i mean uh, uh, as you said uh, pragya there, there is so much of you know misinformation uh, through social media through you know uh, uh, through both written as well as you know uh, other popular forms of media now the internet has all kinds of you know information which is a lot of misinformation so people you know rely on that rather than the word of the doctor or uh, you know rather than the uh, experience that people have you know in terms of case reviews or in terms of uh, such uh, you know clinical knowledge that has been accumulated there's a wealth of knowledge now about you know about medications so in terms of what medications do right medications uh act on you know most medications in psychiatry in uh, uh, mental health act on neurotransmitters in the brain mm-hmm. right how they act is they change uh, the levels of the neurotransmitters through different processes so they directly also supply the neurotransmitters or and they increase it in the uh, synapses in the neurons that neurons are the brain cells right or else they uh, actually change the way the wiring is uh, in the brain the changes that have happened in the brain it it reach you know uh, it sort of uh, tweaks those changes and makes them uh, normal again right or else uh, sometimes they also act on the peripheral areas of the body like for example in anxiety you have you know your heart is beating really fast uh, your hands are trembling you feel you know you, you're uh, sweating you're you're drenched in sweat you feel like you're going to faint so even that is taken care of by these medications so and uh, there are other serious more serious illnesses like you know when uh, we talk about psychosis uh, when there is no uh, reality contact loss of reality contact and people hear voices and they you know feel like you know people are there to get them out to get them um, they feel like people are stalking them there are cameras everywhere so you know if you imagine yourself in that situation if we imagine ourselves in that situation how much distress a person will be going through so the medications can actually change the neurotransmitters responsible for those kind of symptoms and bring those symptoms down so the person experiences you know the the hallucinations and delusions those can be controlled and then the person's distress goes down they can become completely functional so uh, today we were talking about women's mental health we were talking about perinatal uh, you know uh, illnesses so i have seen so many uh, women with postpartum depression who cannot enjoy their their child you know they cannot enjoy their newborn they feel not bonded or not connected with their child uh, sometimes you know a, a more serious form of it is when they feel that oh this child is not mine this child is actually you know sometimes they feel like oh this child is uh, uh, you know uh, come from somewhere else is an alien has come to you know uh, spoil the family 
or they feel that their uh, husband will take away the spouse will take away the child so you can again you know a phase of life which is you know supposed to be something that is you know uh, a phase when you are supposed to experience support love and care and also feel good about your child and bond with the you know child that that is completely taken away by these mental illnesses so when we give these medications i have seen drastic improvement in the women they you know they they start connecting with the child they start you know bonding with the child uh, you know the 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 risks that are involved here if a mother is not able to feed her child a mother is not able to take care of the child the child is at risk uh, just by that and sometimes it is even worse there is a risk of violence also there right and there is a risk of high risk of suicide in the mother who is experiencing postpartum psychosis so all that risk also goes away the mother you know becomes more you know like uh, comfortable in in uh, dealing with the role of being a mother taking care of the child so so many good things can happen with medications and uh, these are all you know one thing is these are short term medications they are taken for a period of 1 to 2 years right uh, yes in you know, a longer term than maybe normal what you call as normal medications of course you know when you consider diseases like diabetes and all that diabetes hypertension you have to take medications for a prolonged period of time so uh, you know in in comparison to that this will be actually less there is one to two years of medication so you know it is not lifelong medications are not lifelong medications have uh, good effects they can make you think normally again and feel normally again they can make you functional you can improve your quality of life okay you can you know and you can come off the medication very safely hmm. wow i think that is very very important for us to convey you know the idea that there are times when you really might need the medication and it's not going to last forever there will be a you know the doctor is a competent person so if you know you have to make sure that when you need help you seek help so it's okay to be not okay and uh, lakshmi janki and myself are among the several mental health professionals who are eager to help and always happy to help so seek help whenever you are in a situation where uh, you know your mental well being is feeling challenged you are not feeling as happy and functional as you would like to be thank you so much lakshmi and janki for being here on ek sambhad at aruni mankuran it was a pleasure having you and thank you so much for sharing your insights thank, thank you pragya and janki it was good sharing a platform and talking about these uh, vital issues thank you thank you Thank you.